Hi. So this video is on the second rod rotating problem. Um, so as I look at this rod, this time it's uh, of length L, so I don't have to worry about something weird. Um, and I guess this time it is being supported at the middle, at its center of mass, the rod's center of mass. And there's one additional object here. So I'm going to first write down the rotation inertia of the entire object, including the object at uh, the 2, two m mass at the end, because I think that will probably be needed at some point. So let me write it down. So the rotational inertia of the whole thing is equal to rotational inertia of the rod plus rotational inertia of the mass. So you can look up the rotational inertia of a rod being spun about its center of mass. It's a 1 12 m L this time, it's the whole capital L, ML squared. That's the rotational inertia of the rod. Plus the rotational inertia of the 2M mass. Well, it's at this distance L over 2 away. So it'll be 2M, how much mass there is, times L over 2 squared. So if you go through the algebra, it's uh, 1 12th plus uh, 2 times uh, 1 over 4, so um, 1 over 2 or 6 over 12. So the whole thing is 7 over 12 ml squared. All right. Uh, I'm just going to save it on the side here and um, bring this up if I need it in the future. OK, so let's uh, go through the question. Part B uh, asks, does the mass of the rod affect the angular acceleration of the rod? Oh, yeah, it does. Um, you can actually look at it um, in the calculation here. So because the rod is being supported at the center of mass, it doesn't exert any torque. There's no, the weight of the rod doesn't exert any torque, but it does add to the rotational inertia. Without the rod, the rotational inertia of the whole thing would have been ml squared over 2. But because of the rod, I have to add 1 12th. And this ends up being my total rotational inertia. So if the, the mass for the rod was heavier, then this portion will be bigger and it will affect the angular acceleration. Good? Okay. So it says, find the angular acceleration of the system about its pivot point when it is released. So I hope everyone has this intuition that if you let go of this, it will rotate um, because of the 2 mass on the side. So let's start out with a free body diagram. So this uh, line represents the rod, um, and the forces on the rod are, there's the force at the middle of it, uh, weight of the rod pulling it down, that would be mg, and at the same point, midpoint, is the tension pulling it up, and it's this tension that uh, makes this point the pivot point. Now, there's one more force this time. It's the weight of the, that it's, it's the mass of the 2M mass that I am writing down separately um, because that seemed easier when I thought about it. So um, here's the 2MG, 2MG. So this is the free body diagram. Our center of rotation, as the problem um, gave us, is this pivot point. So the only force that's uh, providing any torque, generating any torque, is the weight of the 2M mass. It's generating counterclockwise torque. So, all right, let's write down the net torque equation. Um, I think I can actually do this without ever writing the net force equation, which is good because um, I don't really want to figure out uh, tension if I don't have to. Okay, so net torque is going to be the torque due to the 2M mass. So it's a force times the lever arm. Here, the lever arm is the distance from the point, the perpendicular distance from the point to the pivot. That's just gonna be L over two, as in the figure. So the torque generated from that force would be two mg times the lever arm, L over two, is equal to m G L. And that's it. Um, and we make the counterclockwise direction positive, so this is positive MGL. 
as you, I hope you remember, the Newton's second law for rotational case is that net torque is equal to rotational inertia times angular acceleration. So let's solve this for angular acceleration. So angular acceleration is equal to the net torque divided by rotational inertia. And we found that rotational inertia earlier, so this is where it's useful. So net torque is mg L and the rotational inertia is 7 over 12 ml squared. Cancel out what we can cancel and, and a factor of L. And simplify this and we end up with 12 G over 7 L. And you can double check that the units work out. 1 over second squared is what you expect for angular acceleration because radian is the real unit. So that's it. Uh, this is part C. Find the angular acceleration of the system about its pivot point. All right, let's move on to the last part. What is the maximum velocity of the point mass? Hmm. So my intuition says that it's going to rotate. And when the point mass is at the lowest point is when it should be moving the fastest because um, that's when it has the lowest uh, potential energy. So um, it, I, it, this is set up looks like something that conserves energy. So I would say, all right, so this conserves energy. Um, so when the potential energy is the lowest, is when the kinetic energy will be highest. So if, do you share that intuition? Yes. Then uh, let's draw the snapshot. So this is a snapshot two. Uh, I'm going to label the initial one as snapshot one, retroactively. So in snapshot two, this is what it looks like. The rod is now hanging vertically, and the 2m mass is at the bottom of this rod. So the center of mass of the rod, uh, let me label that. Um, We are going to say the center of mass of the rod is at the position y equal to 0. This will simplify some of our expressions. So, um, so that means the height of the rod actually didn't change. It did rotate, but since the center of mass remained at the same point, it, the height of the overall rod didn't change. The potential energy of the rod didn't change. That's the important part. And the other important number to know is the y position of the mass it's now at minus L over two, and it has lost some um, potential energy. Um, okay, uh, let me label the snapshot one. So snapshot one is what we've been working with whole time, the initial setup that was given in the problem. All right, let's just start out with the conservation equation. So as I said, this looks like a situation that should conserve energy. So let's say energy is conserved conservation of energy. And whenever I use conservation law strategy on a problem, I like to start out with the statement of what is being conserved. So here, the statement of what is being conserved is the total energy. Total energy in snapshot one is conserved, meaning it's not changing. So that must be equal to total energy in snapshot two. All right. Let's break it down and write out expression for each of these. Uh, total energy in snapshot one is actually zero. The potential energy of the rod and the mass is zero because they are at zero height. Um, this is where I define the zero height. And uh, its kinetic energy is zero because it's not moving. So we start out at zero energy. Now this zero energy is equal to, so in the snapshot two, the potential energy is negative. The gravitational potential energy is negative according to the 2m mass having swung down. So let me write that down first. So that's um, 2mg force times the displacement minus L over 2. That's going to give me a negative number. Plus, um, so this loss in potential energy goes into kinetic energy. And I am going to choose to describe everything here 
as rotational kinetic energy. So I'll say this is my pivot point. Pivot point doesn't move. The only thing that moves is um, the, the, the rotational motion. So let me write this down as rotational kinetic energy or one half I omega squared. Now, here's one relationship to keep in mind. So um, this e equation is in terms of omega, but we are being asked for velocity of the point mass. So we have to look at the geometry here and convince ourselves that uh, this relationship I'm going to write down is true. That the velocity of the point mass is equal to angular velocity of the rigid body times the radial distance of the point mass from the center of rotation, L over 2. So um, if you're convinced that that's true, then uh, we can write out the simplified version of this equation here. So let's uh, write it out. It's uh, 0 equal to, let me simplify some terms here. The first term is minus mgl. So minus mgl plus, uh, let me plug in what the rotation inertia and omega is now. 1 half the rotation inertia, 7 over 12 ml squared times the omega squared, which would be, oh, I should have solved this for omega. Uh, let's do it in my head. Omega is equal to 2v over l. So let me plug that in. Then it's uh, 2v over l squared. All right, uh, some things cancel out. Let me mark them first. This L squared will cancel out this L squared. The 2 squared will cancel, so 4 will cancel out enough of the 12 here to give me only 3 remaining. So 2 times 3, that will be 6. 7 over 6, and V squared is equal to that. So writing out, all right, what is V? So this is the maximum uh, velocity V. So maximum velocity V is equal to, all of this moved over to the other side, MGL, um, MGL, divided by the things that were left on the right-hand side, uh, 7 over 6M. So, oh yeah, I guess I can just write it down. 7 over 6M. Oh, I forgot to cancel out M. So let's do that now. So M's cancel out. And what you end up with is, um, oh, um, wait, this should be square rooted. So what you end up with is the square root of 6 over 7 GL. And you can double check to make sure that the units work out here. G, meters per second squared times L, meters. So meters squared per second squared. When you take the square root, it's meters per second, as you would expect. All right, um, so that's a part D. That's the maximum velocity, and uh, we are done. So these rotation questions, I'm hoping that as you do more of these, um, it be begins to feel like a review. It should feel like you have um, seen some of this before or already, like this conservation of energy expression. You are just uh, applying these familiar concepts in a new, perhaps unfamiliar environment. As in, you have to write down this rotational kinetic energy expression, and you have to use this rotational inertia instead of mass. But um, I'm hoping, except for those changes, it'll begin to look familiar. And um, really, a lot of people do struggle with the rotation, but I feel that that doesn't have to be the case. If you keep referring back to what you knew in translational motion, and translate that to rotational case, then um, you should be able to uh, start developing some intuition for this. All right, so I have one more video to go, and until then, bye.